again, my name is Russell Berry with Intake Screens. Um, and uh, I've put together um, a slideshow with some pictures and videos just to kind of give you a, um, a history of our company and, and what we do and some of our projects that we've worked on. And so uh, most of our screens, uh, we build uh, self-cleaning intake screens, uh, mostly all based around fish protection. Um, and so uh, all of this started uh, back in Nebraska. My dad worked on a ranch in the, in the 70s and he was pumping water out of, a, out of a sandy, shallow river there and he was getting leaves and sticks and pine needles and everything in his irrigation system. And so he built a, a self-cleaning intake screen for his pump just solely for filtration to keep, keep his irrigation system clean. And then um, through the 80s, he had a business in Nebraska building really lightweight water backwash um, screens, intake screens, uh, all based around irrigation and filtration. Uh, in 1990, he sold his company to uh, Lakos in Fresno, California. And so we moved to, Cal uh, to Fresno. And um, also in the early 90s is when uh, the fish screens started to become of age because they uh, had uh, protected species of fish. And uh, so they took one of these lightweight water drive screens and scaled it up, built a really big uh, lightweight water drive screen and put it in the Sacramento River up here by Knight's Landing. Uh, so that install, installation was in 93. Um, but from that experience, he learned that there was a need for a, a more industrial grade screen that was based around fish protection, maybe more than irrigation or uh, filtration. Uh, the screens we build, we primarily use wedge wire screen material. Wedge wire is a really nice screen material. You'll see a whole bunch of it around here, but it's a triangle shaped wire. And so the slot actually gets larger um, so that any uh, flow, the, the maximum flow velocity is right here at the slot and then it, it slows down um, as it goes through the slot and it, it heaps uh, any material from clogging up that, that slot, that, that opening uh, slot. But then we also add a brush cleaning system. So the exterior brush pokes through the wedge wire screen material to, to wipe it off. And then the internal brush um, rotates and extrudes through the screen to, to keep anything from growing inside the screen. And so it's a really thorough cleaning system. And so we, we adapt this cleaning method to um, you know screens all different shapes and sizes. We also build a, uh, a cone screen. And so picture this over your bathtub drain. Uh, water flows through it and then the brushes sweep around and wipe it off. Uh, these are, we primarily use in really shallow water environments. Um, so where, where water depth is an issue, we can get a lot of screens submerged really low. Uh, so creeks, rivers, um, and then we started building these uh, in the late 90s. There's um, a bunch of, uh, projects that we built screens for uh, on Grizzly Island um, in a tidal estuary uh, marshland. Uh, we rotate these screen cylinders by the, uh, with either with a hydraulic drive, so we have a, a motor in the screen that rotates the, the cleaning system, so we can do that with a hydraulic uh, drive. Um, we have an electric drive system, so these, this is just a uh, submersible pump motor that's coupled to a high reduction gearbox. Um, and this, this uh, electric drive really opened the door for us to operate a screen that's maybe um, uh, further offshore. Um, so we can, we can go a quarter mile, a mile offshore uh, and put a screen out in the bottom of a lake or something and have the controls back on shore. And then we have this turbine drive um, system which is here on a couple of these screens here in the yard. And, and this just uses the energy of the water going through the screen to propel it to, to spin the, the turbine, which is coupled to a high reduction gearbox. And this was originally developed because down here in the Delta, there's a lot of sites where they're, they're just siphons. And so there is no power available. And so we'd go out and look at this, this intake and maybe it's a 14 or 16 inch pipe. There's no power available. And so we could put together this turbine drive screen 
and, and screening that, that intake um, without having to add any other uh, you know, power or anything like that. And it just uses the energy of the water to, to run the cleaning system. And then when we're, every site's different, all, all site conditions are different. And it's primarily um, the fish screen criteria that drives the design, which is gonna be the slot size and the uniform velocity. Um, but then there's all the other site conditions, um, you know, uh, head loss and ice and muscles, and so we'll get into that. So the slot size, most, most uh, screens in California are designed around a slot opening of 1.75 millimeter, which is about a sixteenth of an inch. Um, in Texas, we built some screens that are, have quarter inch openings or eighth inch openings. And in New York, um, uh, screens in New York we've built are 0.75 millimeter openings. So they're much more conservative screen criteria in New York. Um, and it, so it varies, it varies from region and it varies uh, for you know, what type of fish are present and what they're trying to protect. Um, uniform velocities is a big part of it because we can't have a screen that has real high velocities going through it, sucking everything up against the screen or, or, or um, through the slot. So we, um, that's what these, this suction pipe manifold is you see on all the screens. You can see through the screens out there. And that's just a baffle system to restrict the flow near the intake and encourage more flow further away from the intake. Um, and, and it's just an effort to evenly distribute the flow across the screen surface. And then um, anytime we have multiple screens on a manifold, then there's always a, an effort to balance the flow um, across multiple screens. And so in this particular example, it's hard to tell what that is because it's, it's a foreign object, but um, you'll see it in some other pictures that come up. But this is 16 screens that are all hooked together on a manifold. And we built this big um, uh, array of screens so that the flow path from the center of this intake out to each screen is the same distance. And so in theory, it should draw the same amount of water. And so we were able to show that as in a CFD model. And then that's what we use to, to design the, that system, which we'll, we'll see more in a little bit. Large debris, this is always an issue. Um, we're always building screens that are out in the waterway. And so uh, traditionally you'll see like a lot of, like maybe power plant intakes, in, uh, screens are designed to remove debris out of the water. They're keeping their screen clean and they're removing the debris and it's going into a dumpster. And with fish protection, it's better to put the screens out in the, in the water source and have low velocities and leave the fish and leave the debris in the, in the water and not, not handle it, not, not try to remove it. And so a lot of our screens are out in, in the waterway. And so then consequently you, you deal with, you know, trees and, and branches and, you know, boats and, you know, everything that would come downstream. Uh, and then uh, ice is a huge um, obstacle in some regions. And so this is, uh, up in Montana, there's a big river that has a, it freezes over and then it thaws in the, in the spring and that, that ice comes downstream and it's the size of cars, you know, that, that come crashing down the river. And so this screen system is able to be raised up out of the water uh, when they have the ice flows. And then this is, the other picture is the city of Bend, Oregon, and they have a, a small creek they're, they're taking water out of that gets ice, the kind of a ice slushy or a, a frazzle ice. And so they have a heated water jetting system around the screens to keep, to keep ice from forming around the screens. And so that's always a, a design parameter that we work around in you know, where it's relevant. Mussels, um, there are certain uh, watersheds across the US that are being infected with mussels. Uh, this is the Colorado River. So this is an anti-fouling coating that's been applied that seems to be effective uh, to keep mussels from growing on it. And then our brush system is really effective at keeping muscles from accumulating or growing on and, or in the screen. And, and that's um, really where the, that internal brush um, does a really good job of keeping muscles from growing in, in the screen. And silt and algae, this is, this is a, a screen that's just right down here in Clarksburg. Um, 
and this is very uh, typical of Sacramento River. Um, and I say Sacramento River mostly um, it, it has a lot of sediment, a lot of silts moving downstream, and so you get um, waves of mud that settle on any surface. And so um, what you'll see, uh, like these screens that are that are here in the shop, the floor of the screen's flat, the um, and we try to minimize any surfaces so that can accumulate mud. And then the the, the cylinder rotating keeps mud from accumulating um, in or on inside the screen. Uh, hydroids, this is, you know, estuary seawater environments. We get these, you know, mussels and uh, hydroids growing. Um, and again, this is, you know, we have anti-fouling coatings and uh, aggressive brush system to keep that from uh, growing on the screens. And then low water is, or, or trying to get a, a water body that's deep enough to fully submerge a screen. Um, we're always designing around what's the maximum flow rate and then what is the water depth. And that determines the size and how big or how many screens we might need to have to get enough screen surface submerged to have the low velocities. Um, and so this is just a picture of a, this is up in Red Bluff and these screens are 14 foot in diameter, but they can divert water out of three, with just three or four feet of water depth. Um, and the brushes sweep around the exterior of that. And then this is a, just a vertically oriented cylinder screen and we use that because it has the internal brush and, it, it, and the internal brush is really good at keeping sand and rocks and that was an issue um, at that particular site. And then this is a really common scene on the Sacramento River. This is right by Knight's Landing um, where you have this high water level fluctuation. So we would design this system around the screen being you know, fully submerged at low summer flows but then has the ability to be raised up out of the water um, during the high, uh, you know, runoff in the winter time, and then we're, there's there's sites where there's no power available, so we can we can adapt our our cleaning system to run off of solar um, or um, the the turbine drive. And then, last but not least, um, every site's different, and and the uh, method of installation or construction is always different. And so we'll adapt the, the screen and maybe the structure that it's being mounted on to, to go along with the contractor or the engineers that are designing how it's going to be installed. So sometimes, sometimes they'll put in coffer dams and dam off a site and you know, deep water and be normal construction activity. And then sometimes it's, it's all installed with divers underwater. And so with that, we can, we can stand up a complete assembly completely assemble it, put all the nuts and bolts in it, um, test run everything, and then break it down and pack it up and more or less just ship out a kit that would be reassembled or installed um, on the site. And I put together just a couple um, project examples. Um, and these are, these are large projects in chronological order. And so in 2005, we did 2005 and then it was installed in 2006. We uh, built the Reclamation District 999 intake over here in Clarksburg. And then 2010 and 11, we installed an intake dam in Montana. And then 2016, we built Cayuga in uh, New York. And so I'll go through pictures of those sites. So this is just about four and a half miles away um, on the Sacramento River. This is an existing 42 inch siphon when the water's high, they can divert up to 100 CFS. The screens are designed for 0.2 feet per second approach velocity. Um, and so to get that much screen area, we, we doubled up two T screens on a retractable system. So those screens can be slid down the rail over the intake. And then in the winter time, um, when it's not irrigation system, they can pull season, they can pull those screens up and let them sit up, um, up out of the water. So they're not growing algae or you know anything on them and they're not there's no corrosion going on um, so there's just a couple of the pictures when we're designing it and in operation and this is intake dam so this is a uh, 1450 cfs diversion on the yellowstone river in montana uh, this is designed around 0.4 feet per second approach velocity uh, so this site um, uh, here 
in uh, uh, to, to have that flow rate here in the delta, it would be twice the size of that. Um, so that would be a, a, like equivalent of a um, 2900 gallon, um, CFS diversion. So this is a Yellowstone River. Um, Yellowstone River is wild, untamed river. There's no dams upstream of this. And so they'll get wildfires, thunderstorm, and then they just get this slug of debris that comes down and, and it sits in a real low pool in the summertime. Um, the water is screened, you know, going through the screens and then through that head works down the irrigation uh, canal. So this is just a picture of it in the summertime. Uh, there's real low flows. And then the winter time it gets this big ice runoff and so they can pull all the screens up and that all rushes through there, scours out the bottom. Um, and this is this Cayuga Lake intake. Uh, these are all vertically oriented screens. These are seven foot diameter, about 10 feet tall. Uh, there's 16 of them arranged on a, on a single uh, eight foot diameter pipe. And uh, this is an existing intake that we retrofitted um, because they had new uh, fish screen uh, rules and criteria that came out. And so we retrofitted this intake in 2016. It's about 50 feet deep. The, the inside of the, um, all the pipe manifolds coated with anti-fouling coating to keep mussels from growing in there. They have a real bad uh, mussel infestation in this lake. And then uh, the existing power, power plant, they couldn't uh, withstand any more than three inches of head, head loss. And so everything is really big just so they have real low velocities going through the, the piping manifold. And this is a, um, I gotta go out and dive on it this last uh, June. So this has been installed for three and a half years. There's, you know, the muscle accumulation um, on the exterior brush arm. The, the screen's clean. Um, every surface has about three or four inches of muscles growing on it. Um, and these screens have been coming on and running. They run for a minute forward, and then they might run a minute, minute reverse, and then they shut off uh, for an hour. And then so they've been cycling, running, you know, 24, every hour, 24 times a day for the last three and a half years. And then this is a shot inside of the, inside of the manifold so we can open up a big door and then go inside that pipe. So the inside's coated with this blue anti-fouling coating. Um, it's really effective at keeping muscles from growing inside the pipe. And then the, the inside of the stainless steel screens is coated with this copper uh, coating, which you see on, on these screens. Um, and that keeps the muscles from going inside of the screen. And then the, the brushing system um, uh, is effective at keeping the, anything from growing or accumulating on the actual wedge wire screen material itself. So with those brushes? Yes. So there's, there's a bunch of muscles growing on yes. Them. Do they ever extend far out? It, 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 well, that's what I wanted to go see because we installed all this and I was like, I want to go check this out, you know, so I went and dove on it just last month and um, this is what we found. Um, so it looks like the, it looks like the, uh, the internal brush, yeah, it gets a little bit of muscles growing like in the brush, um, but I don't, I think that they, they, they get disturbed or broke off when they come into contact with the wedge wire. But did you have to replace that, uh, that coating? Uh, we haven't yet, you know, time will tell. Um, you just wait, you're not anticipating. Um, yeah, it looked, I mean, everything uh, looked really good, and that's what I was, you know, but anti-fouling coating um, by nature is a, it's either sloughing off or, you know, it's, it's kind of degrading over time. So you would think any kind of anti-fouling coating wouldn't be in like an indefinite uh, solution. It's going to become less effective over time. You see, sometimes you see like you'll get like a calcium buildup or something on a coating and then other stuff can grow on top of that. But. Um, and these are these are oriented vertically because they're in a lake, and so any work that would ever be done to them would be from above. And so, if you want to take a brush out, a diver would, you know, they could pull it straight up. Um, and so that's that, that's why everything was mounted vertically. And then this is just a video of a screen up on the Columbia River. Um, in a, uh, they had they had put in. 20 screens without any cleaning system. They were just passive screens. 
and those became buried. And so then we, we got the job to go out and retrofit that intake. And um, so then maybe two years after we installed it, I got a chance to go out and dive on it and, and check it out. And so it, it's, it's beautiful. It's down there, runs a couple of times a day. There's all this weedy material. There is a water backwash system on this screen. So they're, they're pumping water up a hill and they have all this back pressure. So they have a surge chamber. So we tapped into that surge chamber and ran it back down. So when the screens run, the, the valve opens, water jets out. And so that's what you see. You can get this ball of, of grass and stuff and it'll hit this jet of water and it kind of blows it off um, away from the screens. There, this is in a river but it's kind of in like a back eddy on the river, so there's not a lot of sweeping flow. And so there's this supplemental jetting system to help move any debris downstream. And so the diver, did it, um, did you feel any cold getting right up close to you? To the screen? No. Um, you can take, I mean, you can see like the, the weed right there, like kind of tumbling, falling down the, down the screen. And so generally screen systems are designed around the maximum flow rate, and then you even round up a little more off of that. And so the, um, they're generally pretty conservatively designed. And if you went out and wanted to try to like feel flow on the screen, you can rarely feel it. Or you take like a trash bag or some plastic or something and put it on there, it'd probably like float away because the velocities are, are low enough. If you ever um, I always say that you know, we build all this stuff you know, for cleaning all this, but really the easiest way to ma make a screen work really well is make it too big. You know, just keep the velocities low. Um, and here in the Delta with the, the criteria, it kind of does that for you because you basically, um, you have that 0.2 feet per second approach velocity. So for every cubic foot of water, we have five square feet of screen surface. So you get, it's, it's pretty, yes. Have you ever built um, intakes as big as they want you to build out here? And what is that? Can you remind us how big they are? And then is there any type of fi fish screen that actually is like 100%, no fish loss whatsoever? Is that, does that exist in the world? Okay, so I'm supposed to repeat the question. So okay. the question is, have we built a screen as large as they're uh, talking about building down here in, for the Delta Conveyance Project? And do fish screens exclude 100% of fish? Um, so just for an example, the Delta conveyance uh, screens um, are very similar to these uh, screens that are here in the shop and up on the stand. Uh, the difference being um, they'd be about a foot larger in both directions. So um, it'd be eight foot diameter. These are about seven foot diameter. Um, that would be about eight foot diameter screen. And I think they're... Um, a foot longer than, than what, what these screens are. And we have built screens that scale. Um, but, you know, every, every site's different. So what we built, you know, out of another project is maybe relevant or maybe not relevant to, you know, these conditions. Um, but they're very similar. And how many of those per intake? Um, we have right now that, that intake dam project is... Um, 12 screens lined up on a wall. This project's gonna, ha it has six right now and then they're building another four in the future. Uh, so it'll have 10 on it. Um, and then as far as uh, excluding fish, I might, it's hard, it's hard to know. Most of the California criteria is all designed, uh, based on uh, fish that are able to swim. Whereas when we go to New York, they're looking at eggs and larvae. Um, and so it's, yeah, I don't really know. Um, John might be able to answer that a little bit better. Yeah, I think, so I spent a lot of time looking at different technologies that can protect fish. And you have a lot of systems like Russell talked about that will collect fish and convey them. And you're immediately handling them and causing mortality. And so wedge wire screens leave fish in the water, have a very small slot size and a low through screen approach velocity. And so you have much less probability of in, even interacting with the fish. They can swim up against it and move. Um, even fish larvae and eggs that aren't particularly modal can come up against that screen and you have a sweeping flow that will take them off. So it's hard to say that there's any technology out there that is 100% protective. But if you want to 
build one for a particular site, your starting point would be a cylindrical wedge wire screen, um, and you would design it to really maximize that fish protection. So you'd play with the approach velocity and the slot velocity to achieve what you what you need to. And so in California, we have these federally protected salmonids. You can't handle them. You can't disturb them, touch them, because that's take under ESA. And so you, you'd quickly go to this kind of technology where you're withdrawing water, but you're not impacting those fish. You're not handling them. Okay. Thank you. And, and to be clear, so you said it would be 10 of those per intake on the Delta? Oh, no, it'd be... I think it's 30. I don't, I, I don't know. I've seen lots of different layouts, but Phil would know. You know, the 3,000 CFS intakes would be 30 of the, those big ones. On the 1,500s, some of the options have 1,500. There's, so there'd be, they're each 100 CFS. And I'm sorry, Russell, how long are those each? You said those, those are 100 inches long. Okay. Yep. And it'd be a little bit bigger. Yes, I think they, they, they have them laid out right now, maybe. Uh, it's 100, 200, and then seven foot between them, so um, 280 or 90 inches. There's our 30 feet in. Like these are I think these are about 28. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. 30 times 30. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So if you some of the stuff I showed you in the meeting, uh -huh. their the total structure length is 964 feet. 964 feet. The screen length is slightly smaller. The foot put a foot between them, that's something that can be verified during final design. We might be able to skinny that up a little bit, but right now we've got a foot between them. And then there's a little bit of room on the ends of the concrete structure because there's stuff inside it that we have to be able to get out, and that's on the ends. Okay, so a little bit longer than I can. Yeah, and that's actually shorter than the vertical <coughs> plate ones that we've also right. been talking about. Right. And that, that yes sir. What's the cost of a fish like that? What is the cost? Um, depends on, on all the bells and whistles that go into it. Um, and so it's hard to say, you know, how much. Uh, I think this is a, uh, this project that we're building for the city of Houston is about a $4 million project. Um, and it's, it consists of, uh, six of these screens and 10 of the track systems that are set up out here because they're going to expand on it in the future so they have four spares um, and then the controls. This one would do this? Yes. And do they run 24 hours a day? No. So a typical cleaning cycle would be that the screen rotates like this for a minute forward and then a minute reverse and then it shuts off and so it might shut off uh, for six hours or 12 hours, whatever it's set to. And so, in an area where there's a lot of sweeping flow, there's not debris like accumulating on the screen. It's mostly being swept by, and so we're just keeping the algae from growing on it. Oh, okay. If we had this in like the end of a canal or in the, like a pond or something where the water's not mo moving, then they have to run a lot more often because it might run and wipe the debris off, but the debris goes like this far away and then it's gonna come right back. And so they have to run all the time. And so in a river environment, it really can just run, probably in the Sacramento River, we have a lot of sites, they just run two times a day. Oh. And it's just, it's just wiping the algae off. And then, um, and then it'll shut off for 12 hours and it'll come on and run through another clean cycle. Required by regulation to be able to run complete cleaning in five minutes and they have to be able to run continuously. Yeah, yeah, so the, they're, yeah, so the regulations require a, uh, ability to clean, right. okay. but to but the reality of it is is um, y as long as the screen's clean, and so there's usually a um, and I, I, it, it varies from site to site, but our controls are always based on a timer. So it, um, an operator is going to set that the screen runs, you know, every hour, or every six hours. Say uh, you know four hours into that six-hour cleaning cycle there's a big you know inflatable raft that comes downstream and it wraps around the screen or you know it gets a big slug of something that plugs it up then there would be a differential and that would activate a cleaning cycle as well so um, there's not a sensor actually on it this is all based upon human operation um judgment. well no that's what i'm saying there is a there is a uh, there would be a differential sensor okay. that would be in the background but 
we would want to we wouldn't want to rely on a differential to happen to activate a clean cycle. We'd want to have the clean cycles happen on a regular time schedule, um, you know, just like set to every hour or every six hours, whatever it might be. And then if something happened, um, you know, where it needed to clean more frequently, that then you would see a differential, and it would it would go through go through a cleaning cycle. So in our design, it includes a, a hard what we call a hardware. If the, if the drop ever got too much and the screen wasn't fixing it, it would automatically shut off. It would go straight to the power source and cut it off. Okay. Is that cycle consistent throughout the year, or does it differ with migratory patterns or anything like it, that? It it would it it. Yeah. It uh, the the worst uh, event is the first big uh, runoff. Yeah. You know, where all the all everything like when it rains in October, or November this year. That's that's usually when the water's the dirtiest. Um, but yeah, it can be it can be adjusted per seasons or you know um, you know for you know as needed. But so a couple other things I want to point out when Russell talked about the you know like the garbage bag sticking to it, we're required to have twice as much flow flowing past them as we're ever pulling in. So. In order to get up to the maximum capacity, there's going to be a lot of flow in the river. So it, it'll be a, a pretty good sweeping flow. So the really slow flow in, like he mentioned, it, it's, probably, it's probably even more of a case for the delta screen. Stuff will just blow by. Yeah. The other thing I want to point out is this system, it, it's possible we could end up with a system like this. Probably not with 60 of them, probably not individual winches like this. Probably be a movable crane that would move them yeah. up and down. But the system we're looking at now doesn't use this rail because this is, you notice the pipe is fixed at the bottom. We want the ability to be able to set the screen at a different elevation over time given our, our um, you know, uh, resiliency goals for sea level rise and that kind of thing if the conditions of the river change. We, the, we may have to move up a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's... Yeah. So it's a, rare, it, it's a different system that would be hoisted up and down um, in a guide rail. It would be real similar. You probably it's real similar, but it, 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 there's more, if you're building 60, there's more efficient ways of using less components than what we have displayed here. This is an operator can go up and hit a button and the thing you know, comes up out of the water. Whereas what they're talking about is they might have a, a crane that could be used on, on the whole line. So it might just be one or two cranes that could be used for the, the entire length of screens. So it reduces a lot of components. What's that? There are a lot more flow rate than we're talking about. Yeah, so these, these screens probably, um, well, these are, these are sized for 0.5 slot velocity. So it's a point. I'm not sure because the slot opening is different. Um, they're in a because ours only have a five foot pipe behind them. Yes. Yeah, so, and that's why we can reduce the overall length of the, of the assembly because that center manifold is narrower um, than it is here because we, don't, we aren't handling as much water through each individual screen. Think about here, compared to like a flat plate screen, if you took this wedge wire cylinder and, and unrolled it, both of them, it would be the height of that container, that shipping container, and it'd be about five feet longer. And so that's the like a good visual to compare like a, a cylinder screen to a large flat plate screen. Our flat plates are, well, it didn't take two, they'd be 12, it didn't take five, they're 15, and it didn't take three, they're 17 and a half feet tall. So this is seven, right? Yes. So the smallest flat plate is practically double in height, and the larger ones are almost, you know, three times. So the flat plates, they're, and, they're, and they're longer. So that is, the thing that fisheries folks like, though, is the nice flat surface rather than having the T's sticking out yeah. in the water. That's the big difference. These are, we expect these um, structures to be comparable in cost, so it's not a cost issue and the DCO is evaluating with the agencies which one 
they prefer to use. And I've been showing you guys both all along. Do you build any kind of screen? Flat? Um, we do. Uh, we recently built a flat panel screen, um, mostly because it was part of another system that we were already building some screens for. Um, but traditionally, when we're looking at sites and laying out uh, a structure and figuring out the best way to do it, we mostly always come back to a, a cylinder screen just because it it's really efficient. Um, our cleaning system, for to clean this, we have a motor. It's directly coupled to the cylinder. And so when that, that motor rotates, the output shaft's going like two RPM. It's going real slow. It's direct drive, and then it just rubs against these brushes. And it, it can go forward for a minute, it goes reverse for a minute. It's brushing the inside and the outside. So there's a lot of good things about that. Whereas with a flat plate screen, you have more of this linear brushing system. And so it's a little more complex cleaning system. And usually it only cleans the outside of the screen. And so we, we have built flat plate screens, but we usually, when we're, when we're involved in designing or laying out the options, we usually come to this uh, conclusion, except for the cone screens. And that's, that's just because we can, we can get a lot of screen surface submerged low with a with a cone screen the one that looks like an octopus it like a little space shuttle yeah, yeah. yep well, we're not using those because of the flow rates we're talking about they'd be so big they'd be massive it, yeah it's not an efficient way the the cylinder screens is the most efficient way of getting a lot of screen surface um in an area actually there's one over there isn't yeah we have one right here in the driveway and and feel free to walk around and look at stuff. And um, there's a propeller drive screen over here. You can spin the propeller and kind of feel how, how that uh, system works. You can look inside of these. None, none of these are turned on. Um, so, and then uh, this screen that's set up over here, we just got done you know, welding all that this last week. And so I was like, well, we got people coming over. Let's get it set outside. And what, what that is, is that's a, a screen with a finer slot size. It's one millimeter slot openings. Um, and so that's a little bit tighter on the wedge wire. Is there a water jet on there? There is. They're, they're pumping water. It's in a pond. And so I feel like the bottom's going to silt up underneath of it. And they're pumping water up a hill. And so they can, they're going to be able to drain that pipeline. And then we plumbed it back to that, so it can just jet out underneath the screen. Oh, cleaning underneath. And just and just clean underneath of it whenever they turn the pumps off or want to drain the line. We we have jetting in our structures, and it's similar to what he's talking about. Yeah. But it's not built in. Yeah. And I was going to say we've recently added a submersible pump in the in the screen. And so we'll just have it uh, coupled right here in the back. It's just like the same motor as our drive unit. It's just the third motor. And then we can plumb that to a spray bar on the brushes or blowing down. And so we're doing that on a project for ice. We're going to, um, we're going to have a pump in the screen and it's going, it's going to blow water out towards the surface to, to create a boil to keep ice from forming along the wall. Um, and the, the beauty of that is there's no plumbing. It's just the electrical cable that's going down there anyway. But that could be done, you know, down underneath the screen from the inside out, you know, to induce flow. Are these copper coatings allowed in California? No. Yeah, I didn't think so. No. Yeah. I don't know why, because they work the best. They work really well, but um, yeah, Texas and New York is where we've had this type of coating. Radials, there's a set of, all right, so these things are attached to a structure, attached to these pipes. These pipes have control gates on them. And so by pumping 40 miles away, they induce a drop between the river and the sedimentation basins behind them, right? So we modulate the gates, and we have flow meters on every meet, on every stream, so that the flow caves within either the permitted or the desired amount. The desired amount is the desired So the gates punch downstream, like I said, they start pumping and the gates control the flow through each of them. So, so, Phil, there is a gate behind each screen? 
There's actually three. There's three gates behind you. But one right behind the screen. So and is that what you're gonna use to so you can you can um, you're gonna have a gate and a flow meter? Or we're probably gonna use the the furthest downstream gate to modulate. We got all these gates for a variety of reasons. For dewatering. So she wants me to take my mask off. So we have the gates for for a variety of reasons. We have to be able to isolate the facility for flood protection and for maintenance. So that's what the main gate right behind the screen is for, is just to be able to isolate the piping. When you pull up the screen, we also have a drop-in gate so that fish can't go through when the screen's not in, right? Mm -hmm. And then it, it goes through the levee, and at the back of the levee there's a structure right before it goes into the sedimentation basins. And that's also for isolation, but one of those gates in there on the downstream end, it's like 50 feet, or well, no, it's like 100 feet away. That will control the flow through that pipe, which flow, controls the flow that comes in through the stream. So on the, on the intake, so the, the flow from the intake should never be stronger than the natural flow. I thought I heard you guys say that earlier. So the, the way the regula regulations work is the... Um, there's rules about what they call bypass flows. That's the flows that sweep past, right? The sweeping flow versus the flow you take in. And there always has to be twice as much velocity, and they do that by flow because it's flows proportional to velocity. So there has to always be twice as much flowing past as you're bringing in. So let's say we have a 3,000 CFS intake. The river upstream would need to have 9,000 CFS in it now, these rules are being worked on by DCO. I'm, I'm giving you general, I, I don't know if it's exactly twice. A lot of places it's only one time, right? So I gotta be careful with that. I don't think those actual rules have been worked out with the agencies, but in general, there's a rule. So let's say it's two times. So there'd have to be 9,000 going by to take 3,000 out. And, and when Russell talked about this 0.2 feet per second, you, you got I want to put that in perspective. If you were out strolling around in a park, you're probably walking at two feet per second. So we're talking about the flow coming through the screen at about one tenth of the speed you stroll that we've been strolling around here. So it's really coming in quite slow, and that's why he said like a garbage bag may not even stick to it. Yeah. It's a sweeping velocity will take it past. And that's and that, what's that? Times sixty. Yeah, but that's why the that's why the structure is so large is because of that really conservative approach velocity. Is that that almost it? It doubles the size of the intake compared to like something you would build in Oregon or Washington. Well, or even further up river. Yeah, yeah, it's a third larger than than past the I Street Bridge. So like the, the three parts of point two screen, but the city of Sacramento is big. Both, that's a 0.33, so it's, it's you know, more than yeah. one and a half times yeah. faster coming in because there's no delta smelt, at least at the time they built that. Today that would probably be a 0.2 as well, but the one we have up at Knight's Landing for Natomas, um, those are 0.33 screens, that's for Salmonids, and then 0.2 is for delta smelt and other juvenile delta species, you know, sturgeon and other things like that. Did you build Freeport? No. Freeport's flat plates. I'm already impressed with the engineering and how these screens yeah. work. We all are. But I'm kind of thinking to myself, as good as these things are, what good are they if the fish get past here and get sucked down the old and middle river to the pumps where Clifton Court isn't screened. Well, Clifton Court is a, is a different issue that's, un, I, I don't really know what to tell you about that because it's not part of the, our project. I, I, I understand what you're saying now. It's clearly an issue. Now, the idea would be that when we're running this, maybe they're not running that, but that's an issue that has to be vetted through people, just, I mean, so who's working we, we, on This that? has come up at the SEC it, quite a few times. Um, that's just something you have to deal with DWR on. Who's working on it? I don't know. Is I know anybody somebody working is. on it? It's not part of the it's Delta Conveyance so project. Cool. 
Our project bypasses all of that. What's the, maybe you just talked about this, and I may have missed it, sorry, if so. Uh, but let's just say you've got 9,000 CFS coming down. You're converting three. What's the impact for velocity or anything further downstream? Since you're, let's just say you're taking out a third of the floor, what happens to the flow just downstream? Anything in particular? I don't know that. I, I think I Not think the DCO is DCO is in the process of evaluating that, mm -hmm. and it's I think it's part of their EIR analysis. Great. I don't really know. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, just when you're when you've got a length of these things going on here, what ability do you have for any mitigation like on site? I mean, can you put like big trees in boxes along the way for riparian habitat, shading, anything like that? Or is this when you have these in you have to have a clean and industrial? You know, a lot of our a lot of sites that we work on, we're retrofitting like a an old pump structure. So if you went over and looked at the nine 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 facility it's a 42 inch pipe going down the levee with riprap and there's an oak tree right there beside it you know and the screen like squeaks past it without you know it's not in the way but it's close um, and so in theory you could build a, a facility like that but i think on something of this scale it's more it is more of an industrial facility because it's you know it's a big civil works right. project and intake and so they have, they have, um, I mean, Phil can tell you all about it. Well, I don't know but. what they're planning for Green Bank restoration. There, that's, when yeah. the EIR evaluates what the structure does to the river bank, then they propose mitigation. I yeah. don't know what they're yeah. no, I do know that all the places we're looking to put them, for the most part, don't really have a lot of, there's bushes, yeah. not really any trees, per se. Yeah, from our perspective, we wouldn't care if there was a tree between every screen. Um, but we're just building this widget, you know, and how it's how it plays into the 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 levee system is probably a bigger deal, um, you know, as far as what that what kind of vegetation's on the levee than. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. <laughs>